in. And uh, it's Christmas time. I, uh, I, f I feel like it's officially the Christmas season. Once, once Thanksgiving is over, I'm ready for Christmas. I, I like the song, It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year, because it is, to me, I, I enjoy it. Now, I, I've, I've always told you that fall is my favorite season, but uh, Christmas time is, is, is the most wonderful time of the year. And I know that it's a hard time for some people, but for me, I always enjoy Christmas. I always have everything. Ever since I was a little boy, I've always enjoyed Christmas. And, uh, you know, not just for the presents. I've always enjoyed the presents. But, but you know, we used to, uh, growing up, we would see family that we never saw before, you know, never saw during the year. They would come in or we would, uh, we would get together with, with our uncles and we would get together as a family and, and we would always... We'd always eat. We, that, that was just a given. We're going to eat. We, we, Christmas is going. We're going to eat like we do at Thanksgiving. But the day after Thanksgiving, it, for us, it's a tradition. Our our tree goes up. We uh, we go and get our tree. We put it up and we decorate it. We decorate the whole house. And uh, here, the past couple years has been a little harder. Uh, our our girls have used to it was all the girls and uh, the whole family would get together and decorate the tree now it's me and Christy and and it's just not the same but we still I love Christmas time it's just I, I love getting into the spirit of it and um, but this year um, you know from from Thanksgiving on to New Year's we we we're going to talk about Christmas I love Christmas Christmas songs but this year we're going to do something a little different and and this was uh, through our our why the nativity we are we've got a sermon series that starts next Sunday uh, that we start out with uh, why Jesus became a man why Joseph why Mary and then last is why we need a Savior. And that was the sermon series that came along with this movie, and it's a great sermon series. And, uh, and as, along with that, I've added a couple. N the Sunday, uh, we're going to finish up our can with our candlelight on this series. But I've added for the Christmas morning, we're going to talk about why we worship Him. We're going we're gonna to talk about the, the uh, wise men that came and the shepherds that came, and we're going to look at why we worship Him. And, um, but today, we're going to talk about just why Christmas, why the whole nativity, why, why it's important, why it, why it happened the way that it did. Now, we're going to answer some of those questions throughout the rest of the, um, throughout the, rest of the season, but I just want to look at... at the things and the people that surrounded Christmas. I'm going to look at three things today that we see in the Christmas story that I know a lot of people, because when I was younger, I used to wonder why, why these things were important. Why, why the, the parts of the story were so important that it was put in here. And um, I look back, and I find out that there, it's because of prophecy. We, we see that they're, they're, they're specified in the Scripture because they were prophesied years and years before. And you know, I used to think that God, that the things happened in, in here because they were prophesied decades before. But now I realize that they were prophesied because they were going to happen. It's all part of God's perfect plan. And today I'm going to start out with one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. Uh, once again, my thing's not working. But we're going to start with my favorite scripture in the Bible, Luke chapter 2. And this is one of those scriptures that I've read hundreds if not thousands of times, and most of you have as well. We'll read it several times, or at least portions of it, several times throughout this season. I will also, Christmas morning, before we do anything else, we'll read it as a family. Um, we, we do this every year. And, and it is, it's a, it's a scripture that changed the world. I, that's one thing I want to I focus on. The, the events that happened at Christmas changed 
the world for everybody whether you believe in Jesus or not whether you believe in God or not it changed the world for you but Luke chapter 2 and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed and this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria and all went to be taxed every one into his own city and Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea under the city of David which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David to be taxed with Mary his espoused wife being great with child and so it was that while they were there the days were accomplished that she should be delivered and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the fields keeping watch over their flock by night and lo the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were sore afraid and the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into the heavens, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go into Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it, wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Lord, we thank you this morning. We thank you for this gift. We thank you, Lord, for the Christmas season and all that it means. We thank you, Lord, that you chose to come to the earth. We thank you that you gave us salvation through this baby. And, Lord, we just pray that you would help us to understand it better, but you would help us to share it with those around us. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, I know that's a long scripture to read, and it, we're not going to cover all of that today, but I wanted to just... I love to read that story, the whole story. And, and as we look at it, there's a couple things in it that I want to, to point out, some things that I just want to touch on today that, have to, that go back to the prophecies. And, and we see these things and some of the questions that people have, have concerning the birth of Jesus and, and concerning the greatest or one of the greatest events in history. Most people don't think of it that way. They think of it as a birth. And, and let me tell you something. When, when you have a child, when you witness a birth, it is an amazing thing. Uh, and, and many of you women here have, have given birth and you know the, the life changing that it was for you and, and, and you men who have, who have, uh, who have, have, have been there for the birth. Uh, that's a life-changing event as well. But just having a child is a life-changing event for a whole family. But when you, when you look at this child, as, as miraculous as all births are, and as wonderful as all births are, this one changed the world. It changed not only the world, it changed the way that everybody looks at the world. Now, I, I look back and... and Christianity is the, or, or at least Judaism, is the oldest of the religions. Now, if you Google it, I'll give you a disclaimer here. Google tells you that Hinduism is the oldest. Because they, they don't consider Judaism starting until Abraham. But the God of Abraham, 
the God that we worship, the God of Christianity, goes all the way back to the beginning of time. Goes on past the beginning of time. So in my book, it's the oldest that there is. Because when you, when you start with nothing and create the world, that's the oldest, right? And that is the God that we serve. So it is the oldest. And, and in with that, all other religions, whether you believe in Him or not, whether you believe in Jesus or not, your time is measured by Him. Now, I don't know if any of y'all have, have done any Googling or any, anything recently about time, but you'll find that most articles no longer say B.C. or A.D. It says B.C.E. or C.E. They have changed B.C. to B.C.E. Instead of before Christ, now it means, get this, before common error. We are in C.E., which is common error. Now, that means that we are in the year 2022 of the common era. Guess what? It still started with the birth of Christ. They can call it whatever they want to. It started with the birth of Christ. You can deny him all you wanted to, but his birth changed your life. His birth changed your time. Whether you accept him or not, his birth changed the world. And it's also, he's the most influential being that's ever lived. He had more followers throughout history. I love the, I love the statement that was made in Acts when they, were, when they were trying to get rid of the followers. And they said, just leave it alone. You know, we, we've, we've seen this religion pop up, and when he died, his followers went away. You know what? 2,000 years later after he died... It's still going strong and even stronger today than when he was alive. He said, if it's of God, nobody can stop it. Amen. And nobody has. And, and he's the only, the only religion, the only deity, the only, if you, some people want to call him and say he was a prophet, he was a great teacher and all those things. If he's not the son of God, he's crazy, Right? You know, all these other religions, they, they like to talk about Jesus. Well, he was, a, he was a great teacher. He was a great man. No, if he's not the Son of God, he was a lunatic. Right? Because he claimed to be the Son of God. So therefore, if you have a religion, or if, you, if, if any religion holds him up to anything, then they're saying that he is the Son of God. Because if he was a good man, he told the truth. So we look at this and we, we see the importance and the things that he did. You know all the other religions at least acknowledge him? They won't deny him. They can't deny him. You know what? He will never be denied. Some people would argue that Easter is the most important day of the year. And let me put it to you this way. If he hadn't been born as a common man and lived a perfect life, Easter would have no meaning. Now, to contradict that, if he had been born and not died and sacrificed and, and rose again from the dead, then Christmas would have no meaning. So they are equally important. He had to come as a baby in order for us to see him grow as a man and see him be offered as the perfect sacrifice. Now, the first thing I want to look at this morning is where it happened. We see that it happened in Bethlehem. You look at the Scripture, and it talks about it being in Bethlehem. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we get into uh, why, they picked, why God picked Joseph. But I want you to think about this. He journeyed from Nazareth, which was, which was his, the place that he worked, the place that he lived. Now, from what I learned when I was in Israel is that Nazareth was basically a small settlement that was made up for the tradesmen who were built building um, um, Tiberius at the time. 
Okay, they were building this, this huge city right on the Sea of Galilee, and they needed craftsmen. Joseph was a carpenter. He they made this town in order to, uh, to build the city. We saw the same thing happen when, uh, years ago back in, in the 30s. If you, if you ever study on the building of the Hoover Dam, they, they created a city around there to, for the craftsmen to live in, and that's basically what happened in Nazareth. But as he traveled from Nazareth, this small settlement near Galilee, to Bethlehem, which is a small town outside of Jerusalem, uh, just about five miles outside of Jerusalem. Now, if you measure that with a string, it's about 64 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem. If you were to drive it, it's about 91 miles by the, by the roads. Now, best guess says that it's going to take them a week to travel there. Now, anybody that, that knows anything about pregnancy, doctors don't always hit it right. Okay, occasionally they give you a, 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 a due date and it happens. Sometimes you're early, sometimes they're late. You know, she could have had that baby anywhere along that week-long trek. You know, they tell you if when, when you want to induce labor to walk or travel. Well, this could have happened, but guess what? God had already spoken and said it's going to happen in Bethlehem. Micah chapter 5 verse 2 says, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. You see, God had already established that it was going to be in Bethlehem. So 400 years earlier, he had Micah tell the world that it was going to be in Bethlehem. He wasn't born in Bethlehem because Micah said it. Micah said it because God had already established it. And therefore, it didn't matter how long they traveled. It didn't matter what method they traveled by. If she walked or she rode a donkey, it was not going to happen on the way. It was going to happen in Bethlehem. Now, I want to clear up something. This is, this is one of the things that... You know, we see stories and we, we, we hear about it and in every Christmas play we have them arriving at night in Bethlehem and having that baby right then the, when they, she gets there. They could have been in Bethlehem for a week. They could have been in Bethlehem for a month. All we know that the, that the inn was full. Now, I want you to think about this. This little bitty town back 2,000 years ago probably didn't have but a couple rooms in the inn. A couple of weeks ago, when, when Christy and I traveled down to the, to the uh, TBC, to the, the convention, we stopped in Nashville. We wanted to watch a, a Predators game, so we stopped in Nashville. Little did we know that Nashville Predators was playing that night, and then the next morning, or the next day, the Titans were playing. There was not a room under $600 to be found in Nashville anywhere. Nowhere. I mean, you, you pull it up on, on Hotels.com and everything was full. We had to go 40 miles outside of Nashville on the way to Memphis uh, to a little place called Dixon to find a place to stay, and, um, it, which is a lot cheaper there anyway, and it got us a little further on our way. But the thing is, it, it would be going into Bethlehem. Now, remember, there has been a decree that everybody has to go and get registered in their home city. David had a large family. Everybody had to come to Bethlehem that was a descendant of David. It would have been like trying to get a, a room on race week. It just wasn't going to happen. And therefore, they were probably staying with family. I, I, remember the, <laughs> I remember watching the plays growing up, and we'd always, they'd always say, the innkeeper would say, well, I'm full, so we've got a stable out back. That probably wasn't the case. They were probably staying in the lower room of a house of, uh, of, of one of their families where, the, where they would bring the, the animals in during the winter. And, and therefore, uh, he was laid in the manger. We don't even know that it was a stable. What we do know is that it was established that he was going to be born in Bethlehem. How long they were there, we don't really know. But we know that that's where he was born. We know that, that it was going to be that way because it was promised to David. It was promised to David years ago, and then and we, about a thousand years earlier, God promised David that he would always have someone on the throne. 
Now, we've been studying in, in Samuel, we've been studying the life of, of David on Sunday nights, and we, we see the problems that he had and the, the issues that happened. But you know what? God made a promise to David, and God fulfilled that promise. And therefore, that's why it had to be that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. The second thing I want to look at is the fact that he was born of a virgin. Now, science, science would tell you that's not possible. Science would tell you that there has to be a fertilization of the egg. Now, they didn't know all the science back then. They didn't know how everything worked. They didn't know all the, all the details. But you know what? They were smart enough to know that it took a man and a woman to have a child. We have people today that can't figure that out. We have people today that say that there is no, that they don't, they don't believe in gender. Let me tell you something. God created man and woman, and it takes both to make a child. Now, it could be artificially done, but it, ha it still takes a man and a woman, except in this one case. One case in all the thousands of years that, this, that, that man has been on earth. One case, because it's miraculous, because it is something that, that, that goes beyond and, and is not, it, it's not what we normally see. But it had to be this way. And here's why it had to be this way. Jesus had to be the perfect sacrifice. And in order to be the perfect sacrifice, he could not have the sin nature of man. He also had to come from a woman who was pure. And Mary was. And therefore God implanted Jesus in her. And she had never known a man. And that's why it is so... I used to wonder why, why it would say that, that, that she traveled with Joseph, her espoused wife, or her, his espoused wife, as, they were, as, as I would read this growing up. And I didn't understand that. Why she didn't, they didn't just say her husband. But it had to be espoused. And the reason for that was is they had never consummated a marriage. So therefore, they weren't fully married. And therefore... Jesus is the only child that was born of a virgin. And why is that important? Because Isaiah, 700 years before, in chapter 7, verse 14, says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now this was... this. The thing I love about prophecy, the thing I love about the prophets that, that we see is that God gave them to us for a sign. No other person in history has fulfilled this prophecy. No other person has ever fulfilled this prophecy. Now, you go back and look at Micah. There has been other people born in Bethlehem, no doubt. But this one, nobody else has fulfilled. Nobody has ever fulfilled more than two of the prophecies concerning the Messiah except for Jesus who fulfilled them all. And this one was 700 years ahead of time. Now, God gave us the prophecies to prove who he was and to prove that Jesus was who he said he was. Jesus was given the power, or Jesus used his Christian or his godly power on earth in order to show the world who he was. He gave power to the disciples to show who they were and who they were a follower of. We see the signs and wonders, but the fulfillment of the prophecies was to tell who he was, and so the world there would be no, no doubt. Jews were sitting there looking for a Messiah, waiting for a Messiah, and here comes the Messiah that fulfilled all the prophecies, and they still didn't believe. But not only did, did, did we see here that, that she was a virgin, but I love the fact that, that he told them what he would be called. Now, he didn't use the name Jesus. He said Emmanuel. Now, Emmanuel is more of a definition than a name. Because Emmanuel means God with us. Which defines Jesus. He is God. 
He's not the Son of God. I, I know that we, we call Him the, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We, we, we define it that way, but that's so our simple minds can understand. But He is God. He is deity. He is not a created being. He is God Himself. You read John chapter 1, we see that He's the same God that created the world. And He stepped out of heaven, came to earth as a baby to live among us. He is the definition of Emmanuel. And it had to be that way. It had to be God who came and sacrificed himself and gave us this sign. And the last thing I want to look at is the fact that he's in charge. He is in charge. This baby that we see this Christmas story, this nativity that we look at and we see that he is, that, that he is born and he is, he is grow, he's going to grow up. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. We talk about positions and we talk about governments and we look at, we look at governments that have come and gone and we see governments that have fallen. We see governments that we, we, we wonder about sometimes and we see presidents come and go. You know, I've heard it said that the, the President of the United States is the most powerful position in the world. Let me tell you something. The President of the United States will one day bow before Christ. All. It's, it doesn't say the government of America. It doesn't say the government of Israel will be on his shoulder. It says the government. In other words, he carries the, the weight of the world. He is the king of kings. All kings, all rulers, everyone will bow to him because he is the wonderful counselor. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting father. He is the prince of peace. Now, growing, when you have a child... All parents, at least I hope all parents, want the best for their child. I, want my ch I wanted my children to have more than I had. I wanted my children to do better than I did. I want my children to be more successful than I was. I want them to be smarter. I want them to be stronger. I want them to do greater things. I want them to, to, to be all kinds of things. I, want them, I wanted them to see them grow up and fulfill dreams. But here we see a prophecy that says Jesus will be over everything. He will be called Wonderful. He will be called Counselor. He will be called Mighty God. And you know what? We worship this, this season. We, we talk about the baby. We talk about the baby in the manger. And man, it is great to see babies in the church. And it's great to, it is so beautiful to see a baby. And it's, it's, it's just heartwarming. But imagine this. Jesus, as much as we like to think about him as a baby in a manger... He's not the baby in the manger. He's not the man on the cross. He's king of kings. He's the everlasting father and he's the prince of peace. He is reigning on the throne. He is in heaven. He's got the world in his hands. We still, we still celebrate this time of him being born. We celebrate him coming to the world. We celebrate later on in the year, we'll celebrate his sacrifice for us. We'll celebrate his raising from the dead. But let me tell you something. He is ruler. He is God. Amen. And we have to remember that. As we look through all the prophecies and we look through all the things that happened and we look through the things that he did on this earth and the humility that he took on and the... You know what? While he was a baby in the manger, he was still God. He still had the power as a baby. 
but yet he got hungry. He used the bathroom in his diaper just like every other baby. He had to be picked up and carried and fed and everything just like every other baby because he threw off all of that to come as we come. He is Emmanuel. And he went through all of that for us. He went through all of that for people because he wanted a relationship. Because he wanted to establish the new covenant with people. And so many people throughout the world, they, they want to go to denying that he even came. They, they want to call time BCE and CE because they want to deny him coming. But let me tell you something. If you don't acknowledge Jesus Christ, you can worship all the gods you want to. You can worship all the, the anything you want to. But if you deny Jesus Christ as God, as, as Bugs prayed earlier, there is a place called hell that we don't like to think about, we don't like to talk about, we don't like to mention sometimes. But there is a place called hell. And all those who deny Christ, all those who, who do not accept Christ, and all those who, who, who do not accept what he did as a baby and growing up as a man and sacrificing his life and dying on the cross and raising from the dead, will find out about that place called hell. What you have in this life today is the best you'll ever have. But if you know him as your Savior, you will one day get to see him on the throne. You'll get to, to fall before his feet in a way that is not forced. We'll get, I'll get, you know, everybody will fall before him. All, all knees will bow to him. But isn't it so great to know that I will be able to do it by choice? I will be able to do it because I love him than to do it because I have to acknowledge Him. If you're here this morning and you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, there is no greater season, there is no greater time than the, than the time that He came for you. It's a perfect time to come for Him. So if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, think about the prophecies. No one else has fulfilled those prophecies. No one else can fulfill the prophecies of Jesus. Get to know him. Give your life to him as he gave his life for you. Whatever it is this morning, maybe, maybe you need to give your life to him, but maybe you're here this morning and maybe you just had a hard time getting into the Christmas spirit. Maybe, you, maybe you've just had a, a, a hard time this past year. We're coming up on the end of the year. Maybe you've had a hard time this past year. Maybe you have things that you, that, that you just need to lay before Him. Whatever it is this morning that you need, I'm going to invite you to come as, as Hunter and the musicians come. Let's all stand. Lord, we come to you today thanking you thanking you that you gave us Christmas. That we have this time, Lord, that we acknowledge your coming to earth. That we acknowledge you as God. And Lord, I pray that, that if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, Lord, that today would be the day. In your name we pray. Amen.